has a it was it's interesting to be introduced because I don't think of myself that way of course but if I can affect some people in a positive way that's an amazing thing give it up for my lovely wife Kelly over there and um, what I have to say is I, I, I guess I'm honored to be here speaking first because uh, what, what makes what I'm saying different than all the other authors here we're here to hear some authors but one amazing thing we all have, I think of Albert Einstein, one of the greatest minds of last century. He said, imagination is greater than knowledge and everything that ever was or ever will be is contained all within the subconscious mind and we all have access to it. So as authors, and I'm speaking for them, I believe, that we access this intelligence and something comes through us. And, we, and, and when the pen goes to the paper or the fingers go to the laptop, whatever it is these days, uh, you begin to find something comes through you. And our ability to understand our minds in, these, uh, in amazing ways uh, is the first thing I talk about because we all have a mind. From the day we're born to the day we die, the only thing we have to attract the um, utmost positivity, uh, prosperity in our lives is our mind. And the better we understand our mind, the the better we can have all this attract to ourselves. But the thing is, we never had an instruction manual for the mind. But if it did, what would it have shown us that would make our life uh, a little bit easier, more prosperous, and more full of joy? But not only, the, only do we have our own mind, we also, our whole lives, are dealing with other people's minds, really. And everyone has their own perception. So our ability, people always joke around on the shows, people go, um, do I hypnotize my wife? <laughs> And she would always go, no, and I always go, oh, all the time. <laughs> you know? um, but the truth is, really? Is that a bad thing? Because what is, is no, hypnosis is heightened communication. So my ability t to express myself through my mind and also communicate effectively to somebody else is, I think, the utmost to have good relationships in our lives. So I think of authors, they're expressing themselves ultimately in the other end to have people read and experience what came through them and that and that's why I think it's all about it. it's like going to a movie you get into a movie some people they get so really hypnotized with reading that they forget they're even reading it's a wonderful characteristic of our mind that um, that's always available to us and so what I do is I help people understand my book's title is called awaken your visionary mind power and this is book one I had this vision <laughs> And the book one's called Thinking Beyond Habitual Thinking. And I talk about the mind tools of meditation, mindfulness, power of attraction, and self-hypnosis, and what they are. So we can begin to notice the little subtle actions in the mind that were right in front of us. And so, and once you begin to notice things, then you begin to open yourself up to all these possibilities that are sitting like right in front of us. Like right now, what do you see? Speak up. What, go, go on, what do you see? And I didn't ask anyone to look at my hand. The point is, we literally get so hypnotized by our problems that we forget to see everything else that's sitting right in front of us. And when you begin to open your mind and quiet your mind, see, most of us are hypnotized all the time. Of course, we don't look at it that way. But, I mean, we're creatures of habit. Everything everything we do is a habit and a function of the subconscious mind. And before we had any habits, we were just little children trying to be like a bigger brother or sister, kind of mimicked by our parents and maybe some icon on TV. And eventually we gradu gradually acquire all these little habits of doing and thinking things that help eventually define who we think we are, good or bad. So the idea, of course, is to keep the good habits and, and modify the ones that maybe we're good at one time, but aren't useful anymore. So, as a hypnotist, really, what am I doing when I do these events? I'm really taking people up here that are kind of hypnotized, and I'm dehypnotizing them for a moment. And I, if I could talk to you from inside your mind, I'd have perfect control of you because you would think it was you, and it would be the perfect deception. But isn't that happening all the time? So we, what, people go, I can't be hypnotized. I go, is there anyone that can get you all pissed off? They go, yeah. And I go, well, they just hypnotized you. I mean, I do some talks in schools, and um, the bully is a hypnotist. 
And he doesn't know he's hypnotizing his victim, but he's learning to get this emotional reaction from his victim. And that's why this kid, this victimized person, has his own personal hell going on. But if I can teach this child what it means to not react, and then all of a sudden he walks up to the boy, he, has, he understands that he's trained his mind to not react. See, we're very hypnotically suggestible creatures. So much so that we pick up suggestion all the time, and we don't know it. And so, if I could teach this bully child what it means to not react, he'll walk up to a normal situation, the bully does what he does, and he goes, you still doing that? And you just walk over and it rolls off you, like water off a duck's back. And, but yet, at the same time, the bully finds he can't get the reaction, next thing you know, and they start talking, and all of a sudden they have a new relationship. See, if I react, I become subject to that which you react to. I'm a pilot, I fly. And always the question is, is flying safer than driving? I hear that all the time. I've been flying, I, I'm 60 by the way, and I've been flying since I was 14. And it's just, to me, sure, if the plane's safe and it's, the weather's good, yeah, I think flying's safer, <laughs> really big time. One day, building that unusual home upstate New York in Lake Placid, it was a six hour drive, of course I'd rather fly my plane up, it's only two hours. And as a pilot, we make these decisions, fly or don't fly. Or if you fly and the weather goes bad, land the plane and rent a car, don't push it. Or learn how to do a one, just learning how to do a 180 degree turn and go home. Well, anyhow, the weather was bad and we're, here we are driving up to Lake Placid and she knows that I always like, I hate, you know, how many times you're in the car and you're like, the weather turns sunny, I get all, whatever. Anyhow, we, we drove up, we drove back, and I counted eight possible fatal accidents that I avoided. So really, you're all you're drive here, right? You're not drivers, you're accident avoiders. That's what safe drivers do. The more aware you are, the more you're likely to disarm things before they get bad and you avoid accidents. And it's not, not the same thing as dealing with people. Because when you're dealing with people, you're also dealing with not necessarily that person, but you're dealing with what's gotten inside of them. And remember, it takes two people to create an accident, one to stop it. So if you're always aware and you're that bully, and you're, all of a sudden you're very aware. And then you look over them and it can't get through. It's like a computer. And um, we all have a computer now. And one day, maybe at one point, you noticed something's wrong with my computer. And you go, oh, I got a virus. And you go, how'd that get in there? It snuck in undetected, didn't it? And then it, if it messes up your system, it's not operating right. So you get this virus software, and uh, it goes down there, and it knows how to grab some information, amazingly, and pull it up and contain it for you and say, hey, you want this in your mind and your computer? Yeah, no. And then it puts this barbed wire fence around your computer, your mind, a firewall. And every time something suspicious tries to get in, it goes, alert, split second recognition, and then you go, hey, do you want that in my mind? Do you want that in my computer? So you, now you have a choice. So once it gets in, you don't know the difference. You're hypnotized. And that's how easy it is. It's happening literally all the time. Uh, I mean, like I said, habits aren't a bad thing. We fall in the patterns of the thinking really quick and fast. Um, here, try not to fall for this. Just, I'm going to spell something. I want everyone to tell me what I'm spelling. All right. P-O-K-E spells? Speak up. P-O-K-E spells? J-O-K-E spells? What's the white part of an egg? Ablamen. <laughs> but we fall in the patterns quick, and they stick. And that's how it, easy it is. It's happening all the time. <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> she always likes some of the things I come up with. How it's hard to see, like I said, though. I mean, I think of... Uh, driving, great habit. How many people here drive? Raise your hand. Get in the left side of your car, you drive down the right side of the road. It's a great habit. But you don't look at it as a habit, do you? It's an amazing habit. You can focus on other things, you can daydream, listen to the radio, have a conversation, you pull in your driveway, and I don't even remember driving. How many people that happened to? And these days, you don't really need to think. You just speak to it. You go, home. <laughs> you know? It's crazy. But, you wouldn't know how much of a habit that is at all. It even recognizes it as a habit until you had 
well, we're going to go to Australia tomorrow and you're driving. That means you're going to sit on the right side of the car and you're going to sit drive down the left side of the road. Now, I don't know if you had a chance to do that, but when you, if you have or if you will one day, all of a sudden you have to think left, think left. Like someone wants to talk, don't talk to me. I got to think left, think left. You kill yourself if you don't keep focused. When you get to intersection, take a left and red. You take a right, you cross. It's weird just going down the road 70 miles an hour and cars are going this way. But after 15, 20 days of doing that, you got a new habit. That's, how it ha that's one way of changing habits. We're picking up suggestion all the time. Advertisers spend billions of dollars every year to get ideas in our heads. Finish the sentence. Winston tastes good like a... Fly the friendly skies of... Hey, please don't squeeze the... I try to go to the supermarket next week and go down the tissue aisle and try not to notice Charmin. <laughs> Mr. Whipple. <laughs> but the thing is, 40 years ago, those commercials are off the air and it's foremost in your head right now. So think about what's a visionary? A visionary is a person that can create a vision of exactly what you want and focus on it without being pulled by all the things that suggest otherwise of what you want to be, to be who you are. And the better you get at it, the more you cannot be pulled in by the resistance from things that you react to every day unconsciously. And I, it's like post-traumatic stress syndrome. I mean, I, what's hypnosis? Hypnosis is suggestion accepted. Hypnosis, when something on the outside gets on the inside, and typically when emotions attach to it, it gets in much more effectively. And I think of soldiers who have had traumatic experience on the battlefield and their friends' heads are getting blown off, it's terrible. And then they kind of snap out of it and they go back to society, but it got in. And that's why some stimulus that will bring the past written into their present and it just wakes it up again. But aren't we all subject to that as we go through our own battlefield of life? So meditation, and I like, you know, people who meditate. People that are, I have people coming up to me all the time. They're so afraid of it. They're so afraid of it. Sometimes they're afraid of it. Sometimes they don't understand it. But meditation lets you know the difference. And mindfulness lets you live the difference. It's like snapping when necessary, especially. Go have fun in life and all that. But when something confronts you and you alert, put your, activate that virus software, be mindful. So meditation lets you know the difference. Here, let's put your hand down. Everyone put your hand down. And just for a moment, I want you to experience it. And what I want you to do is listen to all the sounds you hear in the room right now. You hear the air conditioner, of course. You hear my voice. And notice the sound. Just listen. Keep listening. And while you're listening, be aware of the hand you have extended. And notice the blood flowing through your fingers. It's always there, but your hand may feel warm. It may tingle. Don't think about it. Just be aware of your hand. And you notice your hand will begin to tingle just a little bit. And you hear the sounds in the room. You hear my voice. And you notice your hand tingle. Be aware of your right thumb. You can close your eyes if you want. Be aware of your first finger and your second finger and the next finger. And notice when you're in a thought, notice that, simply. Bring your attention back to your hand again. And every time you notice you're not, a, you're not aware of your hand, you're in a thought, bring your attention back to your hand again. And your hand will tingle. Now open your eyes. And how many people's hands are tingling? Raise your hand. Okay? Sim and your mind's quiet. Simple meditation exercise. Stay there as long as you can. That's what meditation does. It brings you to the moment. Meditation lets you know the difference snaps you out of the trance. So you can't be aware of your hand and the thought at the same time. Either you're aware of the room wherever you are or you're in a thought which often is just your interpretation of your reality which is so subjective to so many things. And the idea is to know the difference so you could decide, wait, I don't want to be thinking that way. Use your virus software of your mind. So now you have discretion to determine if I want that thought hanging out in my mind. So ideally, 
when you begin to understand what this is and how to use it, maybe you have a negative thought. You oh, stand back from it, fire software, and then you go, wow, oh, I can change the way I look at this. And begin, you can begin to notice the, like I said, when you focus on the hand, you get hypnotized by it, literally by your thinking. But when you stand back from it, you can notice another way of looking at the whole thing. And for most of us, the biggest change that any of us would only hope for is simply a perceptual shift. Perception. All right, right now, my finger. Which way is my hand going? Everyone look. Just which direction is it going? Everyone, see it? Kind of clockwise? Okay, I'm, I'm just going the same direction. And now look at it still. Which way is it going now? Clockwise. Look at it, right? Okay, so when you change the way you look at things, everything changes. An all new opportunity will open up for you. That's right, because we're so hypnotized by so many things and so many ways that we've accumulated through our lives. When you begin to open yourself up to that, you can begin to choose your life. And you can begin to choose your perceptions. It's like going to a movie. Someone says, hey, you got to check out this movie. It's amazing. You've all heard that. So your friend told you it's a good movie. So you grab your friend, you go to the movie, and you're hoping it's a good movie. And you're watching the first scenes of the movie, and it's kind of boring, but you keep watching it, and you're watching the first scenes, and it's still boring, and you hope, waiting for that break. And the lights come on, and you walk out, and go, that, I'm sorry. I thought it was going to be good, because Johnny said it was going to be great. And it was the most boring movie in the world, and you wondered, what were they thinking? How many people that happened to? Raise your hand. All right, now, the fact that it's at the theaters, well, some people like it, some people don't. It's your perception that dictates your experience. So in life, if everything's cool and awesome, and you feel amazing down to the core of your soul, don't change anything. I think that's a good thing. But if you feel a little funny about something, my message to you is to be able to recognize that and say, wait, I can change the way I look at that. And once you do that, you find you have control of your life differently. And not only in your experience, but physically too. Let me, um, I have a, what do I got here? I got a, I got a, um, a lemon. And a lemon's a fruit, not like an apple and orange. We don't eat a lemon, because it makes your mouth water and pucker. Smell citrusy, you know. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this lemon right. Okay. Here I got this lemon here. I'm gonna bite into it. Mm. All right. Right now, don't think. If your mouth's watering, raise your hand. Don't think. Okay. Sometimes the whole crowd raises their hand. <laughs> Just think, I caused a biophysical reaction in your body with just a thought. You know what a placebo is? It's a fake drug, looks like the real drug. And the FDA requires that the real drug perform just a little bit better than the placebo on a consistent basis. Not a lot of bit, just a little bit. And sometimes, in the test, the placebo actually performs better. So therefore, we know that the belief is a huge part of the healing process. I did a show for 150 doctors in Harvard. And I go, well, and then State University, I've done a lot of uh, healthcare stuff. But what are you going to tell these guys? I remember the guy that booked me goes, they think they know it all. You can't tell them anything. They don't want to be there. So I have to relate to who I'm talking to. So this message that's going to come into this is something that we can all apply to all of our relationships, and that is this. So I, I, said, I said to the doctors, why do you need to understand hypnosis? Because in a sense, you are a hypnotist, really. And I brought the idea of a placebo, because who gives the placebo uh, to the uh, patient is the healthcare professional and doctor. So people's expectations that they can help you, and they know more than you know about helping, is, uh, has a lot of power in, in the placebo. But I said to the doctors, if that's the case, how do we make that even more powerful? And I said to listen to your patients and get better rapport. Now, I think of the doctor, you go to the doctor, he's sitting there looking at a computer, and he's saying, oh, maybe these drugs, and uh, possibly surgery, and he's not, you feel like he's just pushing stuff on me, drugs on me, and surgeries I don't need. How many people felt that? You know what I'm saying? But think of the doctor, stops what he's doing, he walks up to you, and he says, hey, how you doing? You know, tell me about, you know, he's, he's actually, your mind jumps to attention, he's really getting on the same page as you are, forgetting all of his medical knowledge, 
and he opens up to you it, and you go wow that little like your mind gets a little brighter the subconscious mind's opening up and that's when you may accept the exchange talk he's giving you more effectively and the drugs he give you may even be more effective or the placebo whatever it is but that principle is so powerful and applies to every one of us, to all of our relationships. The more we listen, because you were thinking about the next thing you're going to say, you're not hearing them. If we could all be better listeners. I know I could be a better listener. And so people go, do you hypnotize your wife? I go, yeah, all the time. I listen to her. And sometimes I, when I listen, really listen to her, and take the time, forget, I want to hear what she's thinking. And I let her know that I really hear where she's coming from. She just opens up, and I like that too, because now we're really communicating. And you know you've had that experience with people. Even if you don't say the right words, you know you're on the same page. And the better you can do that in your relationships, the better your relationships are going to be. And I think the better world we're going to have, or your world will be anyhow. Put your hand up. Make a circle like this. Quickly, touch your chin. And now look around the room and see how many people don't know where their chin is. <laughs> <laughs> so one person go like that. <laughs> but all I did there was I gave you a, a visual suggestion to bypass your conscious mind where it goes right to your subconscious. That's how easy it is. It's happening all the time. And the more aware you are, the more you can learn what it means to walk through your experiences. And rather than your experiences walking through you, taking your awareness. Your awareness is your life. And you, you sit still, you feel your hand tingle. That, that's life. That you're alive. <laughs> Otherwise you're an illusion in your head which could be anything. I'm not saying don't use it, your mind to get into whatever you're doing, but understand that you have more options in front of you when you wake up. And whatever it is for you, it's your life, your experience. So you know, this is kind of a small thing. I don't really need to do a hypnosis demonstration here, but really, that's what hypnosis is. And when I, what's a phenomenon that I notice when I do hypnosis, and I hypnotize people, and I wake them up at the end, and they did some funny things up there. It was amazing. Yeah, you know, I, 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 it's, it's you, you, ne you never know what you, you get because I'm helping them be childlike again. Meaning, not childish, childlike. And, I, and I'm not the type of hypnotist to make people chuck like a chicken and stuff like that. I don't do that. But I have fun with them, but I always am there to inspire them. So when they wake up, they look at me. And one lady one night go, am I still hypnotized? And I go, no, you know, I made sure she wasn't. And I go, but I said, this is the state meditation brings you to. Because there's no ego. They couldn't have done what they did. And be connected to their ego at the same time. And I've heard that over and over, and I've hypnotized thousands of people all around the country. And it's always at the end. Some guy goes, it's better than drugs, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's always different, because if you feel like you're almost high. And, 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 but why not get high it, on being who you are? We're happiest when we are who we are. When you're unhappy, it's really trying to, my second book's gonna be called The Power of Pain and escaping the rabbit hole. And I use that title because you know how you get everything's fine, you're having a good day, and some, some thought gets you, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're not feeling good, and you can't figure out what happened. Something broke through the firewall of your mind. But if you meditate, it's an exercise. What's the exercise? To help you understand and strengthen your ability to have split-second recognition. Just put that fire software up. Don't want that in my head. And you stay aware, like driving. You'll be safer. You avoid accidents. You avoid falling into the rabbit hole and getting all full of. Don't forget, when you're dealing with people, you're dealing with what's gotten inside of them, pulling their strings. If I have a coil of a coil here and a coil here, and I charge this one, and this one doesn't have a charge, I just bring them close together. This one picks up the charge of the other. Is that? You know, when someone walks in a room and they got all this negative energy, and the whole room comes down. You know that. But then someone else can come in and bring it all up. It always works. So, so there's different forces going on. And the more you're aware you are, and that's what my book um, attempts to help people uh, become aware of these things. And some people, I find, they reread it and read it, read it again. And, um, and it really helps them. And that's 
my reward to he, see how people really make some good changes for themselves. Why am I even doing this? I don't even know. <laughs> I really don't know. I mean, people always say, what got me involved with this hypnosis thing is, you know, when I was um, probably 14 years old, I heard man only uses 5% of his mind potential. That always bothered me. What, what does that mean? Come on, why are we using 5% of 100%? It just, you know, it didn't make sense. But I think to look at it this way, we're maybe 95% asleep, and we can wake up. I was, as a kid, I used to go, well, if I got the 10%, I'd be better than most of my friends. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. James Mapes, that's interesting you said that. Because after doing a lot of shows for many years, I happened to go to a seminar because I was rebranding myself to do corporate and keynote events, and he was there. And I got to meet him. And I, I know all about him. And I, uh, he does the lemon thing. It, yeah, you know, what, you, know what, you know what's funny? I have to say, I do the, le the lemon thing. I've been doing that anyhow before I ever seen him. And I don't use a lemon. I just say, imagine, use your imagination, imagine a lemon. And I cut it open, I go like, mm, like the faces anyhow. Still everyone raises their hand. I just started using a real lemon. Like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and because I, I um, I'm sorry, about three months ago I, I'd seen him. I went to see him because he invited me down to Fairfield. He was doing an event at the Fairfield Theater. and. Um, he broke out the lemon. And people that he hypnotized 10 years earlier, they fell into a trance right away. They came up, he got on stage, sleep, bomb, nothing. It was, they were, because it triggered, you know. But that triggering is post-traumatic stress syndrome. So when I do a post-traumatic suggestion with somebody, so somebody, I could wait, I could put a suggestion in somebody, and at the end of the show, They'll be in the crowd, and I just have to say the word Elvis Presley. Right away, they think they're Elvis Presley. They come up, they're doing hound dog, I'm going crazy, take the mic, you know. <laughs> um, and then they're like, just going, right. and they go, I want to wait. And they just look at me, like, <sighs> I'm out of breath. They don't even know what they just did. We're all subject to that. And all that is, is I do that because that's just an example of what it's like. And we have our relations with the people, and... And everyone, and people that are, are close to us, they know how to bully us. They know our trigger points. But if we can slowly begin to, I'm not, I'm really religious, I'm a very spiritual guy, Re resist not temptation, you know, meaning just be still and know the truth that it's going to get in your head and it'll take you down. <laughs> but I'm trying to keep it simple. I go on and on. I did bring a little bit of spirituality in that book too, not enough, but enough to relate it to messages of Jesus and stuff. But uh, did I answer your well, you I know James made. Any other questions, though? Please. Um, subconscious, mind. subconscious mind. OK. The subconscious mind and the conscious mind. Well, if this whole room here represented our mind, most of it is our subconscious. And this little dot here is our conscious mind. But that's like our operating system, our RAM. But through that, we can access the hard drive. Interesting. I do these shows and I, someone's in a trance and I go, when I count three, you'll be wide awake and you will not be able to speak the English language, but you will speak fluent Chinese. Wide awake. And I go, hey, how are you doing? They say, count to 10 Chinese. You know, they make this perfect accent. And I don't even think about it. I just think they're just making the accent perfect. One day a guy comes up to me after the end of the show and goes, I'm Chinese. I know him. He doesn't, how did you do that? He spoke perfect count to the ten. One time in the kid's life, maybe he heard it. Your subconscious mind's picking up everything all the time. And so when you get rid of your ego and everything else, you have access to, when you quiet your mind, you may have like little hunches that come to you. Little things. Those are your gifts. It's not the thinking mind. It's like, you know how you just have something? Write it down. That's your gift. To help you do what you got to do to be who you got to be. Um, I was going to say something else. It was like I slipped my mind, but anyhow. Yeah, it, bingo. Well, yeah, sometimes I get ahead of myself because I have something else, and then I, I, if 
I may talk real fast because I'm trying to catch up to the next thing, but I, I let it go because I focused. <laughs> But uh, so your subconscious mind, it's always there. Oh, I, I did a, um, I remember I did an event at a hypnosis seminar in Newport Beach, California. And I remember I was learning a nonverbal induction technique from a f guy that works with the feds. And he would come up to a crime scene and he had a little technique we were learning at a partner. We were learning this technique, how to put somebody in a trance that didn't speak the language, English or something. And once they're in a trance, someone would come up and who spoke Spanish or whatever it was, and they would be able to do a suspect description, license plate number, and that's what he did. So here I was at the seminar, and I, my, had my partner did it to me first, and I was, you know, relaxed, you know, I thought. And um, he woke me up and whatever. I did it to him, he was gone. And I'm just learning about hypnosis at the time. And I'm, gonna, I'm like, come on. <laughs> and the astute instructor looked at me and he goes, you don't believe what you're doing. I guess getting reprimanded. He goes, bring him out verbally and come on stage. I go, okay. <laughs> so I brought him out. I came on stage. I go, show me what I need to know. So I stood here and he said, Foc straighten your body. Make it really firm. Focus on imaginary candle. Close your eyes. Focus on the candle. So I focused on the candle. And I was so focused on that candle. I knew something else. I didn't know anything else, but I was focused on the candle. I kind of knew something was going on, but it didn't matter. I was focused on that candle. And then all of a sudden, I had rapid eye movement. I couldn't stop my eyes from moving, but I focused on the candle. Then he snapped his fingers wide awake. 300 people applauded because during that little time, he had some people come up from the audience. They lifted me up six feet in the air like a board with no effort on my part. And I saw the video. I go, wow. Thank you. I was here. I was playing with hypnosis, and I didn't understand. So when you're hypnotized, you're in a different realm. Nothing different than someone that worries a lot. Worry, worry, worry. You worry yourself sick. It becomes your reality. So a good worrier is a good candidate for being hypnotized because you're doing it anyhow. Athletes do it. They vision it. They see it before it happens. And then when the event comes, it's already done. Your mind, it, it's, more, it's just as real in your mind. Studies have shown it's just as real in your mind as the real experience. It's your perception that dictates your experience. And you have more f control of it than you know. And that's really my message to you guys. So, any handed questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, I'm, this book hasn't been released more than here. I, I will be doing a um, workshop thing, and my wife is going to be doing some things with me too. And I'm finding, I'm just launching all this stuff now. We're going to have a podcast, and we're going to have guests on there, and there's going to be a lot of topics and stuff. And I do live local. I live in Westbrook here. So if you have any questions, just call me. I'm an easy guy, and I'll call you back. We'll chat about anything. And if you have any questions now, I'm here to answer it too. So um, any other questions, you guys? Did, yeah, okay. Let me get my um, wife up here. Thank you, guys. It was truly my pleasure to be here. And Linda, and I, I, I my, it was like a final copy anyhow. I said, just read through the book. And she read through it. And she was so inspired. She wrote the, the commentary in the back. And so I have to I thank her gratefully for kind of supporting me along the way, because I'm just doing this on my own. But I'm, I'm about to launch this kind of worldwide marketing thing. But, um, but it, Linda was wonderful help for me. So give it up for Linda.